It's terrific to be here. Uh, thanks, for, thanks to Harry for uh, tutoring me in university politics for decades, and Stuart, who tutored me on this topic, uh, and Peter, who I think knows everything I don't know. So <laughs> it's, I like when he's in the room, because if there's any question that I don't know the answer to, I know almost by definition that he will. Um, um, <clears throat> OK, so, um, so the idea here is that um, uh, maybe the way to think about it is 100 years or 200 years ago or whenever it was that there was a quill pen and a pad of paper in front of you. Um, uh, and uh, for folks like us, we'd be sort of sitting at a desk and then there'd, there'd be a big stack of books and a stack of articles behind us. And, um, you know, march forward, march forward 100 years and in front of us is a computer. Um, and probably something like Microsoft Word, and the quill, the, the quill pen is gone. And behind us is still this big stack of books and a pile of articles. It's true a lot of them are in the computer, and it's true we have help doing that. But we have, we've sort of solved the problem of helping us write, or a lot of it, but we haven't really solved the problem in helping us read, and there's a whole lot more stuff. We're good at search, which is which sort of helps us find something and then read a little bit more. Maybe we could take a speed reading class and read a little bit, read a little bit faster, but not not very much. Um, and there's and there's way too much stuff. And so the idea here is to is to come up with a way of of uh, understanding large bodies of text um, faster, um, <clears throat> and to and to understand and conceptual and to help human beings conceptualize. Um, ideas from the from the text faster. I thought of like a, a, a name for the software project we had, and so I thought maybe what, <clears throat> what, what it could be is Microsoft Words, right? But I don't think they'd like that. <laughs> anyway, so so um, uh, <clears throat> this is the idea is computer assisted conceptualization. So this is a, a, a quote I like, which is uh, conceptualization goes through classification. Classification is one of our most central and generic of all our conceptual exercises. The foundation not only for conceptualization, language, and speech, but also for mathematics, statistics, and data analysis. Without classification, there could be no advanced conceptualization, reasoning, language, data analysis, or for that matter, social science research. I, I especially like this, that not only language, <laughs> reading, data analysis, but social science research. Um, in any event, so the focus really is on cluster analysis, which is a special case of this, which simultaneously uh, invents categories and assigns documents to the categories. Um, we're going to focus on unstructured text. The methods that I describe here apply to basically any objects, not, not only unstructured text, but that's the, <clears throat> that's the example that I have. And the goal of the talk, or the goal of the project, is to switch us from methods that are fully automated to methods that are computer assisted. So that's the basic, that's the basic idea. Um, so just to put it in context, what's hard about clustering? We call this why, why Johnny can't classify. Okay, that's, that's a joke. <laughs> Um, so clustering seems really easy, but it's not. And so I don't know if you know the, know the mathematics of this, but um, the Bell number is the number of ways of partitioning a set of n objects. Okay, so so the Bell number of of two objects is two because you can take two objects A and B and either put them in the same cluster or put them in different clusters. So the Bell number of three is five. You could put them all together. You could put A and B in one. You can put all of them separately, et cetera. So you sort of work it out. There's five. The Bell number of five is 52. I think you sort of get, get the idea here. Anybody want to guess what the Bell number of 100 is? That's right, it's a big number, okay? But it's bigger than you think it is. In fact, it's bigger than you think, if you, unless you know the mathematics, unless you've done this before. It's bigger than you think, of it, think it is even after you adjust for the fact that I'm telling you it's bigger than you think it is. <laughs> okay, the, the, the answer is it's 10 to the 28 times roughly the number of elementary particles in the universe. 10 to the 28 is about the number of molecules in 10 BMWs. Okay. <laughs> um, so now imagine, it's really it's such an amazing, it's an amazing fact, right? It's an, especially an amazing fact given, given the fact that we classify things all the time, right? But now think about choosing the optimal classification for some purpose by hand, right? Roughly speaking, we'd like to consider them all and then pick the best one. Well, you just couldn't imagine coming anywhere near close to that. So obviously we use, we use various heuristics and things like that. Okay. So, Fully automated algorithms can help, but the question is which ones, okay? So here's the problem with fully automated clustering, okay? So the goal, the impossible goal, is an optimal, fully automated, application-independent method of cluster analysis. 
And there's a, there are a lot of these methods of cluster analysis. Um, but there's this, there's this theorem that makes it seem like this is not really going to work. This is called this no free lunch theorem. So, uh, and basically, roughly speaking, it says every possible clustering method or, or any possible clustering method performs equally well on average to any other possible clustering method if you, if you average over all possible data sets. Okay? So all that really means is you have to know something about the data set. You have to know that this particular statistical method will work really well in data that come from, I don't know, blog posts about presidents. And this particular statistical method will work really well in books about science. Okay? Now, in every other area of science, in every other area of statistics, we sort of know that. Right? We know if the, if the outcome variable is dichotomous. We, we, we know the class of methods that's going to work reasonably well for that if the functional form has a particular specification and stuff like that. Not true in, in cluster analysis. Okay? Just not even close to true. There are a lot of existing methods, um, and they, they come with the, some of the best names in the business, actually, by the way. Um, uh, they're all well-defined, so I don't have any real mathematical criticism of them. They're, they, they're defined from their own um, tradition, either in the statistical literature, or data analytic literature, or machine learning literature. Um, they're they're, they're, they're well-defined, and so they have you know, very clear foundations. But in order to make them work, you have to know when they're going to work, right? Because they basically, you, in goes the objects, out comes the clusters. You're only going to know whether that's going to work if you understand what the objective function is. And if you go read through these articles, um, and there's about 150 articles that describe new clustering methods that have been used by at least one author other than the, other than the proposer. Um, and there isn't a single one that we've found that says, here's the, corp the type of data or the corpus to which you should apply these, th th this method, and this is when it will work. A lot of them come with great examples. Like, I ran it 100 times. I found a couple of times where it worked really well, and I published these examples. But there aren't any that tell you when it's going to work. Okay? So it's, it's very hard to, to add the substantive knowledge. Okay? And um, the, the literature provides no guidance, essentially no guidance, little no guidance as to when the methods would apply. And um, Justin and I I, meant, I, I forgot to mention on my title page, Justin Grimmer as a gra was a graduate student of mine, is now at Stanford. Um, and I tried for about a year to come up with, like, we, like you would do with any other statistical method, a foundation clear enough so that you would know when it would apply. And it just wasn't going to work. Um, so deriving the guidance was uh, difficult for somebody, impossible for us. Um, so the deep problem is uh, full, inf full automation of clustering requires more information, and that information is not available. Okay? So you have this very large literature, and you sort of don't know what's going to happen. And it's not really a surprise. Anybody who's tried cluster analysis, if you take the objects, put them in, you get clusters you like, you're thrilled. If you, get cluster if you take the objects, you put them in, you get clusters you don't like, that's sort of it. <laughs> you just sort of go home, right? There's little tuning parameters, but the tuning parameters within any, any one method give answers very close to the original method. So basically, it's, you know, that's sort of it. Um, um, so, our, so we're going to propose to switch from fully automated to computer-assisted clustering. And so th this, is, this is the idea. So fully automated uh, clustering may succeed sometimes, but it sort of fails in general. Right? It's too hard to, to understand when each model would apply in which particular data set. And so, so our computer-assisted clustering idea in principle works like this. Um, you take all the clusterings, you evaluate every one, right? you pick the one that gives you the most insight, what, whatever that is. I don't care what your objective function is, it's you. Okay? This would be too hard right? because you know, you're a human, and so therefore you're a limited creature, and therefore you couldn't possibly do all of this, right? But in principle, that's what we really want to do. We want to, we want to look at each clustering, and we want to say, that's boring. You're ordering the books by length. I don't care about that. And you go to the next one, and you say, oh, you're, 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 uh, you're categorizing the books by color. I don't care about that. You go to the next one, and you say, oh, it's by uh, strategic misperception. That's a really cool idea, right? I'm going to go with that, right? Um, and, and so that's, the, that's conceptually what we really want to do, right? There's too many things in the list, and so our main idea is that we can organize that list. Right? We, and by organizing the list, it makes it possible for a human being to search through it. That's really like the whole idea of the talk, okay? that we can organize an incredibly, amazingly, unfathomably long list, but we can organize it in a way that's possible to fit it into a head with, of a creature like us.
the Bell number of n. Right. <clears throat> so, I'm, so my subject here is all clusterings produced by the collective wisdom of the, of the statistical, literature, statistical um, biological, and computer science, uh, you know, all these literatures, uh, and, all, all, and the results of all clustering methods that have not yet been invented, and, and the result of any other clustering that could possibly have been come up. So basically the whole Bell space. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it one step at a time. Not a worry of kind of overfitting. I mean, if you really could look at the whole list and just pick the one that. Well, the goal here—it's an unsupervised goal. So the goal, without this, without this technology, we'd have this big pile of stuff, and the goal is come up with some insight. Just come up with some insight. How do you know you have an insight? You'll know. Okay. We'll have to validate it, and I'll show you some methods of validation. Okay. Actually, we spend a lot of time in this in this work on validation. So I'll I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay. Um, so an important insight is that there are many, 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 many clusterings that are perceptually identical. That is, for a human being, they are essentially identical. <clears throat> so imagine you had 10,000 10, documents, and they were classified into six categories, and, and uh, that was one clustering. And then there was another clustering, in which, you, in w which was identical to the first, except you took w one document from cluster five and you moved it to cluster six. Okay? That is, for all practical purposes, exactly the same clustering. Right? It's obviously not, because it's one document different. But from our point of view, in order to understand what's going on, there's no difference there. So as it happens, the Bell space uh, is constructed with a lot, like enormous number of, of clusterings that we would consider essentially the same. Okay, so that's, a, that's an important fact. So there's, there's some structural simplicity in the Bell space. Um, so the real question is how do you organize the clustering so humans can understand them? And um, my analogy is that uh, imagine you're at a, you, you, you go to some, some foreign city and you've never been there before and someone asks a question. What do you do? <laughs> Well, our goal is conceptualization. That's, our, that's really our goal. Our goal is, it's not just clusters, it's whatever it is that you would want to do. It's like if I gave you all the, blog, all the, all the blogs and tweets that happen today, about 120 million of them, and, or, you were, you were, or you were instructed by your, your, your editor at the newspaper you work at, go tell me, tell me what everybody said on Twitter today. Right? There's 120 million of these. Go make sense of that. Or, or take all the academic literature in the field of machine learning. What's that about? Okay. Um, and, you, you, and your task <clears throat> would either be to organize it into some categories that you could write about, or maybe, this is totally up to you or up to your editor or whatever it is, or maybe find an angle that nobody else has thought about that's really interesting that char characterizes what this is, or maybe it's um, is come up with a new idea while sitting in the data. This is like a time honorable way of <laughs> doing stuff. I'm letting you have the objective function. Yeah, it's a fascinating goal, but it's not, it's not a mathematical objective, right? So it's not something you can sort of, sort of formalize mathematically. That's right. That's right. Because if you could formalize it mathematically, then we make an, a fully automated method. Then we're done. And it's easy. <clears throat> right? But you can't form, formalize it mathematically. And that's actually the problem with the literature. Right? Because when we're looking for something, some insight in, in a set of documents or in a set of data, <clears throat> we can't set the, out the object. I mean, what's the, the objective function is I get to publish a new article or something. You know, that's silly. Okay. I mean, it's, it's actually true. But, but, <laughs> but, but, the actual, but the actual objective function is is not, you know, it's one step before that, right? It, it's insight. It's, you know, it's discovery. It's something cool, it's, right? It's, 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 it's a way to look at it so that I can understand a lot of it with a few, a, a small number of things. It depends what you're interested in. But we want to leave that to the, to the user, OK? OK. Um, so, so conceptually, you know, imagine you're in a city, you've never been there before, and you have a phone book, and uh, you only have the addresses, and you don't have a phone, and, um, <clears throat> and you want to get to the restaurant, and you only have the addresses. Or maybe you only have all the latitude, longitude points in the city. There's millions and millions of them, obviously. How do you get to the restaurant? Well, it would be really hard to get to the restaurant with only a list of the addresses, but it would be possible. But if you organize those in a map, then all of a sudden it becomes trivial, right, or, or easy in any event, right? So, so and it, it doesn't matter that there's millions and millions of latitude and longitude points in the map. It doesn't hurt you at all. In fact, if you miss the restaurant completely, like you totally landed on the wrong latitude lo longitude point, but it was five feet away from the restaurant, you know, that'd be fine, right? So perceptually equivalent or essentially equivalent 
latitude longitude points are, are, are fine. They don't, they don't bother you as long as you understand the, the concept, the, organ, or the organization. So we don't have, a, we don't have um, physical geography in order to help us, but we have a conceptual geography. So we're going to create a conceptual geography of the Bell space, basically. Okay. So um, this, is the, this is our strategy <coughs> um, to make it easy to choose the best clustering from millions, of, many more than millions of choices, right? Um, Big, big numbers of choices, <clears throat> um, and we're going to do it. We're going to do it in. Um, the, I, we actually have two methods to do this. Okay, one starting with the with the ex existing 150 methods, and then the other going straight to the to the Bell space. You sort of asked the question before I before I got there. But so I'm going to just take you slowly. <coughs> Excuse me. So first way is uh, we can actually start with the documents, right? Code the text as numbers in, in one of the ways that you all, you all have taught me. Um, you, in fact, in this case, you can use all the ways and create a whole bunch of different sets of numbers representing the documents. That's okay. Um, you can, uh, we, then, we then apply all the clustering methods. We literally coded up every clustering method in the literature that was used by somebody other than the author. Um, we can run it on a smallish you know, a thousand, few thousand observations in about 15 minutes. <clears throat> um, uh, so you get, you get, the result of that is you get 150 clusterings, partitions of the, partitions of the objects. Um, this is too much, even those 150 is way too much for a person to understand, but we'll organize them so it'll help. Um, we're then going to go, we're going to, so here, our, our organization is we have a distance metric, so we can measure the distance between any two clusterings. Right. The two clusterings I gave you the example of before, but where we moved one document from category five to category six, will be very close to each other, and others may be very far apart. Okay. Um, once you have a distance metric, then we can create a metric space of clusterings, and we can project that space down to two dimensions, so we can show it to you. Okay. Um, then in, the, in those two dimensions, we have the 150 points. Okay. We can go another step by saying, well, what's in the white space between those 150 points? Well, we can create clusterings based upon weighted averages of the points that we know. Right? Each point is a clustering, and, and the point is a, is a labeled clustering based upon existing methods. But the white space is, is we, can, we came up with a method called, we call local cluster ensembles, which, which basically creates a new clustering based upon weighted averages of nearby clusterings. Do you follow me? Go like this. So roughly, we're actually going to use a, it, well, I, I'll just give you a rough intuition. So you have a space, I'm going to show you the space in a second, but you have a bunch of dots. Then there's a white, there's white space, you want to know what's in there. We have some kernel, or, kernel around that, let's say like a normal distribution, truncated normal distribution or something like that. So then we know what the weights are. Um, we then, we then uh, create, create a new proximity matrix for that. Based upon where the where the pair where, where, based upon um, the the uh, uh, pairs of documents that each clustering puts in there, and then from that we have a new we have a new proximity matrix, and f and from a proximity matrix you can create a clustering. Okay, so I can show. I mean, we it's written down, but. Yes, that's right. So, so we, we lose information. We, we take the, um, we, we lose information when we go to two dimensions so that you can see it. And, and so we, try, we, use a, we use a scaling technique that keeps, that preserves small distances and it doesn't much matter about long, long distances. Because that's, the thing is we want to group together clusterings that are very similar. And so, you know, it's an empirical question as to whether the information lost is, is important or not. Yes. Now you've got a choice as to which of the high dimensional objects you map out into. But you don't have to go back because in the end all you need is a clustering. That's all. So all we need is to be able to show you as many clusterings as we can 
uh, that you can comprehend and let you choose and give you a very convenient, fast way of choosing. That's really, that's really the idea. So you might worry, and we worry a lot, about projecting you know, this very high dimensional space, which is actually, as a side point, much lo a much lower high dimensional space than people realized. But in any event, it's, when you go to two dimensions, you still lose stuff. Um, <coughs> um, uh, the question is, do, do, did you lose the important things? And that's a very, very important issue. But aside from that, we're OK. okay. Um, so then from that, we create a, an animated visualization uh, to explore the space of clusterings. Okay, so now I'll, show you, I'll show you what that, what that looks like. But basically, if you move a cursor around the space that I just described, there's a clustering over here. And it sort of you know, morphs as you, as you move around. Um, so, and then the idea is that millions of, many more than millions of clusterings would be, would be easily comprehended. Now, we have another strategy that, that you asked about earlier, which is different than this, the, the, this first one. And the idea is to represent the entire Bell space. So we, we figured out that the whole Bell space can be represented in a much lower dimensional concept without, or, or it can be, can be um, uh, what's the word? Um, embedded in a, in, a, in a Euclidean space that is much lower dimensional but still high dimensional. It's n choose two dimensions, basically. Uh, that's without any loss of information. And then we found ways of sampling from that in a coherent way. And then from that, we can project down to two dimensions. The evaluations of the examples that I'm going to show you come from the first method. But the second method sort of doesn't lose anything until you do that, do that projection. The first method, the one that has the first seven points here, uh, is it begins with the basically the collective wisdom of the of the cluster analysis literature. So the second method just includes the collective wisdom of the existing cluster analysis literature and the collective wisdom of the of what would happen to the cluster analysis literature if asymptotically it went on forever and continued to do what it was doing. So I like to be able to say that, so I keep saying it in as many ways as possible. Um, so here's a, just an, an an example that we rigged up. Um, it's a simple example for pedagogy. I'll show you a real example uh, shortly. But this is, this is a real example. What we did is we took the 13 biog biographies of the last 13 presidents. Each, one, each president had one biography. Um, and uh, we, uh, there were only 13 documents. So we did an analysis of it, ran, each of the we ran the set of 13 documents through each of the 150 methods. Um, by the way, the bell space for 13 documents is 27 million. All right, so there's 27 million possible ways of organizing, cl of clustering 13 documents. So even that, even just 13 documents, it's one of these things where it feels like we just would have them here on the, pa on the table. We could easily put them into the categories, right, in a, co in a coherent way. We probably couldn't do that. Um, I mean, we could do it in, in a way, but probably not an optimal way. Uh, 27 million is, is the approximate number of articles and books in the literature on the American presidency, by the way. But, that joke goes over much better in a political science audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, in any event, each of the names here, which is uh, in a font intentionally too small for you to see, is, uh, is, is the outcome of, of an existing clustering method. Um, so that's mclust and, you know, this, actually it's a, the, the, the screen is a little fuzzy, but you, you would be able to see them. Um, the fact, when, when two methods are close together, like the, the, the bump over here, then um, they're giving a clustering that is very similar across the different methods. Across different data sets, sometimes methods give answers very close to each other. Sometimes those same methods give answers far, farther apart. There's nothing special, and, and not more there's n it is not true that there is more likely to be an insightful inf inf uh, uh, inference from the data, uh, from the clustering, if 100 of, the, of these methods produce an answer very similar to, to one another. So, so don't, be, don't be fooled. Don't think that, oh, there's a whole bunch of clusterings over here. That must be where the inside is. N there's no reason to think that at all. Okay? all right? There's none. In fact, there's nothing in the articles describing these things that, that would indicate that. If all it means is that, uh, is that a whole bunch of guys that look sort of like us, right, who came up with the, the, came up with the, the algorithms, um, when, when run through these data, produce similar answers. That's all. Okay. It doesn't, they don't always produce similar answers. Okay, so, um, so that point um, is, uh, produces this clustering. Okay, so what's, what's that clustering? That's one conceptualization of the last 13 presidents. Um, uh, and one, the, the one conceptualization is to take the 13 presidents and group them into two categories. One is uh, Bush 1, Bush 2, and, and Reagan. And so that's often called the Reagan Republicans. 
and then there's other presidents. It's a simple conceptualization, but that's, that's one possible conceptualization. And then if you move the cursor over to here, uh, you get a different conceptualization, which is chronological. So this is Roosevelt to Carter, and this is Reagan to Obama. Okay? So, you may, so the idea here is you move the cursor here, you, you say, oh, that's not very interesting. Right? And so, so maybe you move it over here, and you, see, and you get, oh, Reagan Republicans. That's an interesting idea. Right? Then you say, well, but that's not exactly what I want. And so then the next step you would do here is you'd probably choose a point that's sort of near here, but not, you know, not way far away, because then you get something very different. You probably want to fine tune your results. Or maybe you want to zoom in and you know, like, like expand just around that point. And and uh, and then look you know you know look more carefully, okay. Um, so that's that's the general idea. In fact, that's the that's the, the way it works. And um, we have a we have a computer program that Justin and I can use, and no one else can. Um, and then we also uh, we also have uh, a program that we're actually making. And so this is a demo, which I'm not going to show you yet, but it, it actually works. But you know, not quite yet for anyone else. So this is just evidence to me that, that we're working on it. Yes, Stuart. Oh, the, the number of clusters you can eat. Some of the methods actually choose the number of clusters, in which case we can let the number of clusters vary. That's OK. We have a distance metric that, that um, is in, you know, it, it, it doesn't require this, the same number of clusters in order to, to figure it out. It's based upon pairs of, uh, pairs of documents. Actually, I thought I had it in here, but I guess I don't have it in here. Um, in any event, um, uh, so um, oh, you know what? I do have it in here. It's, it's, I'm about to describe it. <clears throat> so so the, the number of clusters could come from the clustering algorithm, or a lot of times that is something that we know ahead of time. Like for some problems, we say, we, we really we don't want 500 clusters, right? We, really, we want something like 10, right? And so we, we just let the user choose. So another natural clustering example would be Democrats and Republicans. Yeah. Like that's also an example where it may be good for some people, right? It, it, for political scientists, they may they may look at it and say, yes, that's just, that's just what I was looking for. For other people, they'd say no. I mean, that, I think we let you have your own objective the function. Also in the yes, absolutely. Right, right, right. As does every all the other twenty seven million possibilities. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, could you say a little bit more about the the role of the white space versus the, the, the existing points in the sense that are, is, is the user somehow supposed to be anchored to the existing points? No, actually, actually, when we do it, we get rid of all the 150 points okay. because there's no, there's no reason to prefer those to the white space. It, they're then, all just clusterings. But I guess, then just one more question. Um, is the user now essentially able to walk in a continuous way through all possible clusterings now? Like, what role is being made at this point? Well, we've lost some information because there, there aren't enough pixels in the universe to, to really display the whole bell space. So, so we've had to make various compromises and, and, and we coarsen basically in, in various ways. And I hope we're coarse, coarsening in ways that's throwing out stuff that's essentially equivalent to what you're seeing. And so you sort of have to trust us on that. Or, or, well, I'm going to show you empirically that it works, but, but you know, there may be a better way to do it. But it's, it's also the case that the particular embedding you're generating is being informed by the it's being informed by trying to have these black dots be somehow embedded in an informative way relative to each other. So you are using the existing yes. 150 clusters to somehow generate an embedding that now you believe is going to be a useful way for a user to navigate through a space. That's exactly Even if you don't show them the black dots. That's right. That's right. This, this particular space is first constructed from the, con from the collective wisdom of the statistical literature. And then we expand it. Um, we have this other method that doesn't begin with that at all. Actually, I like that. I like the other method especially because we don't even need the content of the documents, right? We just take all possible clustering. Stuart. I've still not seen this role of the previous methods. Why did, what would happen if you just took 150 random clusterings and used those as the starting points? Seen. You could. You could. That'd be okay. I mean, you could. I'm sorry? Well, there's a, that's an empirical question, right? I mean, it depends on the data. It depends on. That's right. Well, that's that, that's actually where we got to the the, the, the next the, the method that we just came up with. We haven't we've we have a draft of the paper basically, 
Um, uh, th th that method takes the whole bell space. It doesn't calculate the distance between documents based upon coding words or anything like that. You don't need any of that, right? It, it's completely, ra it's, it's, it's a ridiculously radical concept, right? It's just, let's just take all possible clusterings and represent them to you, which is, you know, we have to do a big calculation, but we actually only have to do it once. Not once for each data set, just once. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, you know, I mean, are these better than random? That's a, that's, that would be a nice article all by itself, right? <laughs> are you more likely to find, are you more likely to find insight in this space? Or if you continue it out over here, right, where maybe there's more insight over here? You know, this is a good question. Okay. Okay. So, um, so, uh, as you, so basically you choose a point, and when you choose a point, you then have to figure out what's in the clusterings. And so we use some tricks to, you know, this point is being highlighted, and over here you can see uh, the individual clusters, and there's, there's word summaries like statistically improbable phrases and things like that that we're using to, to make it so you can quickly decide what the cluster is, label it, and then go on. Um, after you've labeled a few of those, when you label the next cluster, it'll look to the previous to the previous clusters that you've labeled and say, you know what, this one's mostly economics because you, you, you've labeled that before, you don't have to worry about it. So it's basically just a quick way of getting a sense of what each, what each clustering is so that you can then choose one where you can find some insight. Okay, so um, actually since I briefly talked about that, I'm gonna skip that. So let me, let me, give, you some, let me give you some evaluation of, of, <clears throat> of that this works. So the goal is to validate the claim that computer-assisted conceptualization in this way outperforms human conceptualization or other ways that we've been doing this. And we have some new experimental designs for how to do it. Um, we rely on, on insights from survey research, which is really important actually, because when you ask questions of human coders or things like that, you can't just write a question and expect somebody else, somebody else will, under, will understand it. And it turns out survey researchers have been thinking about this for, for a long time and made a, made a lot of progress in the last 20 years. Um, so we present three evaluations. Uh, the first one is based upon a particular notion of cluster quality. I think you used that phrase. That's in this literature. And we, we, our, our, our research assistant coders uh, evaluate it. Second is we, we, uh, our standard, our informative discoveries. We take two scholars who have been s uh, steeping themselves in data reading basically for a year. And we give them this tool and ask them whether we, whether we can do better. And third is um, uh, we're going to make a discovery, like a real actual scientific discovery in a particular area, and you be the judge as to whether this is interesting or not. Okay? And so here's the idea. First one is cluster quality. So what are humans good for? I'm going to give the narrow answer to that question. Um, so they can't keep many documents and clusters in their head at a time. But they probably could, when we find that they can, take two documents and compare them. Right? That's, a, that's one way we can use our evaluators. <clears throat> so uh, cluster, our cluster quality evaluation is going to be based upon uh, human judgment of document pairs. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to have this experimental design to assess cluster quality. So we'll, have, um, we'll use our automated visualization to choose one clustering. Um, We'll, create, we'll take many pairs of documents from that clustering, some from the same cluster, some from different clusters. Ideally, the ones from the same cluster, people will perceive as similar, and ones from different clusters, people will perceive as, as far apart. We use this coding scheme. We just ask each coder, are these two documents unrelated, loosely related, or closely related? Just one, two, three. It, um, more categories than that are, it turns out not to, be rep, not to be reliable. They don't give the same answer, and, and, we can, and you don't need fewer. Yeah. ones that, you know, you pick documents, and if you look at any two random compared documents, you say, where are these things doing together? They're totally unrelated. And then when you get to some pilot stuff, you say, oh, you know, these look different, but it's actually found something interesting. That's right. So this, so if you go to the extreme version of the way I've been saying things, uh, then the evaluator is only the user and everybody else who cares about them. But you know, in the end, when you come up with a cool idea, if you can't express it to somebody else and convince them it's a cool idea, it's probably not a cool idea. All right? Or at least for the kinds of things that we're doing, we don't want to count it as a cool idea. So we're, um, we're, we're in particular, let me see, we're in particular going to bias results, the results in that sense against ourselves by not, by not letting the evaluators use our method. We're going to use the method, and then, the, and then we're going to hope that they evaluate it as we would conclude. So there, but there is, just following on this, so, uh, there's no 
passing of information from the, the person who uses the cluster in the visualization to the evaluator saying, you know, I chose a clustering that gave me a chronological, you know, so so unrelated, loosely related, closely related could be unrelated in time or unrelated. Of course, in that's right. They have to get it without any communication from us. That's right. And we are, we are each look at just one pair, or they look at many pairs so they can get a sense, ah, this is what's the meaning of it. Well, we show them one pair at a time because we think they can only understand one pair at a time. We, Justin and I are obsessed with making ourselves vulnerable to being proven wrong. We, are, we have spent an enormous amount of time doing that. So, so if, we gave the, if we gave the evaluators the, the, the creation of the method, then the, the judge and the jury, the executioner and the victim and the, and the defendant would all be the same person, right? So, you know, so we're making it harder for ourselves. Maybe in an, I mean, harder than, than it should be because in, real, in, the, you know, in the wild, one person can use it for their purposes and they should achieve their objective. They should do better than we're doing, than we're going to show that we're going to do. That's right. So you're telling me this is a ridiculously hard evaluation. I'm good with that. Because <laughs> you know how it's going to come out. <laughs> Right, and that's true, it's hard. But I think that's okay, I think that's okay. We have to be able to communicate the insight by, you know, if I showed you a group of things, if, if I grouped presidents in a way you hadn't seen before, and you see the same insight that I do, that's an important thing. If you don't see the same insight that I do, and I explain it to you and you say that's really cool, I think that's cool also. But we're, we're, that's a second test, okay. Um, um, Oh, these are, sorry, the, I've, actually, if, these are blog posts, these particular documents. I forgot. I think they're blog posts, if anybody has, uh, I think they're blog posts about. Um, okay, so the question is, do, is the space of documents, is, is, that even, is even that expressed to the evaluator? Like, is that something that they told? No, they don't know what our method is. We just give them, we just give them these, we just give them the documents. But they didn't know they're looking at. We just give them two documents. We just say, here's two documents. Are they, are they, are they closely related, somewhat related, or unrelated? That's all. Okay. That's all. They, they'll see more than one. Um, so they, have, so they, they can start inferring. Yeah, but that's all, that's all, that's all they're going to get. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> so then our measure of cluster quality is the mean, the mean of that one, two, three number within the cluster minus the mean between clusters. Okay. And basically, the bigger the number, the better. Okay. Um, and this is our scale for evaluating things. We, we measure cluster quality for our approach um, and minus cluster quality for, uh, here, actually, sorry, the, the, uh, the docu there are three different sets of documents and I'm going to explain them now. They're not blog posts. <laughs> sorry, that was a different analysis that I did. <laughs> Um, so there's, uh, in the first set of documents, <laughs> um, so anyway, so we take the difference, and if we end up on this side, we win. If we end up on the other side, we lose. You, you, you know what's going to happen here. Okay. Um, so the first set of documents was, uh, if you go to uh, Senator Frank Lautenberg, and you go to, go to his website, he has his press releases categorized in, uh, his 200 press releases categorized into uh, appropriations, economy, education, tax, veterans, et cetera. Okay. So, he, he, so he has a categorization, categorization scheme for a particular purpose, but he has a categorization scheme. Uh, we then took, the, took those 200 press releases, put it into our method, and we chose a particular clustering. Okay. Um, and then we, and then we, then we uh, give uh, randomly selected pairs, uh, some within clusters uh, of our clustering, some, some within clusters of, of Senator Lautenberg's clustering, some between, et cetera. And then we measure cluster quality, and we have higher cluster quality because it's to the right here. This is a confidence interval, or two, two confidence intervals, um, than his method. Okay. Did you choose pairs of documents that are somehow there to... Just randomly. Random yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, the, second, the second set of data is from the Policy Agendas Project, which is probably the most extensive 
coding, hand coding scheme in political science. So they've, they've they've co they code individual sentences and you know, sentence fragments if they're not sentences, uh, quasi sentences, into one of 213 categories. By, by, and they're categories like agriculture, banking and commerce, civil rights and liberties, defense, and things like that. And they've coded an enormous number of categories. They're extremely careful about, about how they do this. Um, I mean, there's no better example of a hand coding exercise in political science anyway. Um, and so we clearly do better than the Policy Agendas Project, um, at least on this particular scale. Uh, and the third one is um, Reuters Financial News, and maybe you guys know this. They, this, is in, this is used in the um, uh, supervised uh, learning, su supervised uh, um, methods of classification as the gold standard. So I like this one because we do better than the gold standard. So, um, so. Um, anyway, each of these were the categorization schemes were existed out there, sort of in the wild, and um, you know we chose a different one. Okay, so that's that's the first method. Yeah. So were the number of clusters from the existing uh, kind of gold standards were they comparable with the number of clusters you ended up with? Oh yeah, so we so we restricted that to make it to make it sort of a fair fight. We kept the same number of cluster cl same number of clusters. Because we could we could have put everything together, yeah, that would have been unfair. Oh yeah, of course our method we 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 have all possible clusterings, including this one, but we just we we played it straight. We looked through the clusterings. We found something insightful in the paper. It describes the insight that we found that we thought was really interesting. Yeah, that's all we did. Okay, so that's one. That's a that's a relatively straightforward me measure of uh, of of um, how good a clustering is. It's not a particularly useful one, I think, but because it's it's all sort of internal. And if you if you wanted to do this, you might as well first ask people whether the documents are similar, and from that form a clustering. But in any event, it's used in the literature. Yeah. So also just doesn't show how well the 150 automatic ones would have done. Maybe they would have done better than. That. Oh, they might have. Yeah, but. Yeah, that's possible. But I'll, we'll, I'll give you those comparisons too. So, um, it, so the, there is a question of the role of the visualization versus you and your students or your group that picks the visualization. Meaning, if, if, if your group were the coders and you didn't have a tool, you might have. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we do the best if, if it was used the way it was designed, which is you're, you, you, you have an objective function, optimize, right? So we're just picking something we find insightful, and we think when other people see the two documents together, they will say, oh, that we didn't re they may or may not have realized that before, but they will see what we saw. I, I guess what I'm getting at is the visualization tool, its performance um, uh, uh, depends on also the person who is picking out oh, that's the true. visualization. That's so true. the question I have in mind, I guess, is what if you gave this tool to someone on Senator Lautenberg's staff yeah, that's and right. they had to pick out the visualization, yes. would it help them? Yeah. Or yeah. similarly for Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't have the tool. We didn't have the, 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 the software in the, in, in the way to do that. I mean, I, I like this test. This is the test. We're going we're gonna to perform these tests, OK? But, the, but this is such a high standard. It's like coming up with, a, with the first unbiased and consistent and efficient method in, a, in an area that people have been working on for two centuries and, and, and saying, you know what? That's not really enough. We have to see whether when we give this new hammer to a person, whether they don't hit their thumb, whether they actually improve their life. And, and actually, I think that's, that's a really good standard. And we're going to try it. But just so you realize, that's a really high standard. Right? You know, I think it's OK that people invented the hammer, even though some people kill other people with hammers. You know? You know, you know, as a hammer creator or plumber. Uh, you know. um, anyway, so that's one, that's one method. So here's a, here's a second method. We, took, we found two scholars, one who was a, um, a professor and the other who is about to be. Um, and each had spent, they're qualitative scholars. They had spent a year in archives basically reading and organizing and you know, doing stuff by hand, uh, the way people have done for how long, Peter? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. 
Um, and uh, we, we uh, I'm not going to tell you who they are, and I'm only going to tell you the vaguest thing about what the, what the, what the substance is, because we didn't want to, we didn't want to, um, we're not going to scoop them right about the substance, but in, in return for access to basically everything that they were doing uh, and, and letting us experiment on them, uh, we gave them this tool also. Um, so, uh, so we created, what we did is we cr first created six clusterings, okay? So with our method, we took, we chose two clusterings from our method. So we looked at this, we took their documents from, for each of these scholars, we put them into our visualizer, um, we picked two points. Now, what points did we pick? We picked two points that Justin and I thought seemed like insightful. Okay, we were not we're not really experts in this particular area, so we didn't really know whether we whether insight was really insight. But there were things we found insightful. We picked two points that were not next to each other, right? Because we wanted we wanted a fair representation. So we picked two points. We don't really care whether they like both of them. We don't expect them to like both of them. We want at least one to be evaluated really well. <clears throat> we then took two clusterings from each of two other existing fully automated clustering methods. Um, and so, so we had two, so for each of these we had two methods and then we varied the tuning parameters within each of the methods to produce different answers. Um, we created, so we then had six clusterings which we think is too much for a person to understand so we created an information pack, particularly with all of the documents piled up um, in each. So we created an information packet um, on each clustering, which included an exemplar document, you know, sort of calculated like the document that was by some calculation most similar to, the, to all the other documents in that, in that cluster. Um, we uh, created an automated content summary, you know, just like some, some uh, words that, that discriminated what was in this category versus others and a, a few other little things and gave them these folders, basically. Um, we then asked them to evaluate the clusterings two at a time. We figured these people had spent a year studying their data. They could do more than just compare two documents. We thought that they could compare two clusterings. Um, and so we did a round robin tennis, you know, like a tennis tournament. We had them do all, all 15 pairwise comparisons. Um, we only care, again, about the single clustering method that wins. We don't really care who comes in second place. It doesn't really matter. Right? Um, so in both cases, there was a Condorcet winner. That's a political science. We think of it as a political science. Yeah, good. You're all, <laughs> it's not a political science term, right? <laughs> so in, bo in both cases, there was a single winner that, that beat other, all the other winners in pairwise comparisons. And the first one, which is immigration, um, is uh, our method. Of course, you know how this is going to come out, right? <clears throat> um, so our method beats, um, this is a, a, a method of fully automated clustering based upon the von Mrs. Von Mrs. Fisher distribution and a second one of that. Then our method, then k-means, which is probably the most commonly used uh, uh, cluster analogous method, <coughs> analysis method. Then there's one on genetic testing. That's just roughly what the area is. And again, our method wins. Um, <coughs> uh, in this case, there wasn't a, um, uh, uh, it, it, there, there was a cycle here. So our method beats k-means, our method two beats k-means one, beats k-means two, beats our method two, beats k-means one. Interesting curiosity. So there's no Gutman scale here, but there's still a Condorcet winner, which is which is our method. So that's the second. So that's the second evaluation. Okay, didn't have to come out this way. And obviously, if we gave the in this case especially, if we gave the the method to those two people, they would come up with something probably more insightful than Justin and I, who are not experts in this area. Okay, and subsequently, of course, you know, after this, we did give the method to those people, and they and they find they still find it very useful. So. So that, that was a good test for us anyway. So here's the third and last um, um, method of clustering. And the, the question here is what do members of Congress do? Hearing no answers. Um, <laughs> um, so so in, in 1974, um, Dave Mayhew, a, a, a still a political scientist at Yale, although he lives in Brooklyn, uh, came up with what is now and has been a famous topology of what members of Congress do. They all, they're all basically trying to get reelected all the time. Okay? But, what do, but what do they do to, in trying to get reelected? Okay? Well, they do three things. They do advertising, right? You know, look at me, I'm a member of Congress, right? Um, they do credit claiming, right? This bridge I built, right? And they do position taking. I am a conservative Republican, right? Et cetera. So that's, that's what they do. And for 35 years, political scientists have used this topology or some others which are basically the same thing, uh, have basically the same, the, the same insights. If you look at almost any syllabus in political science, you'll see this on there, okay? 
Um, it's it's been cited ever since. It's it's the, it's been the standard since you know 35 years ago. Um, so first thing we did is we took 200 press, the, the same 200 press releases from Frank Lautenberg's office that, that I used in that first demonstration. Um, <clears throat> we applied our, applied our method. Um, here's the, this is the space of, just to remind you of what it looks like, this is the space of, of the 150 methods. Um, that particular point happens to be um, affinity propagation cosine, which is, uh, was in a big article in Science in 2007. Um, it happens to be close to a mixture of, of von Mises Fisher distributions. There's nothing in the literature that says it should be, but just they give basically the same answer. Um, uh, <clears throat> the space between methods, so that point is not on one of the existing methods. So the space between methods is a local cluster ensemble. So you see it so it takes the nearby clusterings and takes the roughly the weighted average of them. Um, we looked around the space, okay, and we we saw Dave Mayhew's uh, clustering, or, or sub, you know, things very, very closely like it. We saw other clusterings that didn't seem interesting. And then we stumbled upon a point in the space where Justin and I found something that we thought was really interesting. Okay? And just so we could show it to you, show you that it wasn't luck, we looked for other points in the space where we think we would have come up with basically the same insight. Okay, where, where at least one of the clusters within the clustering was the one that I'm going to describe to you. And that region, and so we mapped out that region. So basically when somebody come, if somebody looked at the 200 press releases with this tool, if they landed in that region, we think they would have found the insight that we're going to describe to you. Okay? So let's just look at that, po that point within the region. It happens to be a mixture of a bunch of different methods that, that have been, um, you know, that exist in the literature. I don't, I don't think anybody's mixed these methods or maybe any methods um, uh, in this way before, um, but, and nor does it really matter what, these me what the mixture is. Okay? It's just a point in a space. It is a list of, it is a particular organization of the documents. What is it though, substantively? Okay? So one of the clusters in this clustering is credit claiming with respect to pork, which is bringing home the bacon to your, to your district. So for example, Senators Frank Lautenberg and Robert Menendez announced that the United States Department of Congress has awarded a $100,000 grant to the South Jersey Economic Development District. It, the, the press release doesn't actually say that they have nothing whatsoever to do with that, but that's a side point. <laughs> you know? um, so that's, so that's, but it's very clearly credit claiming. Um, there was also a, another category, which was credit claiming with respect to legislation. As the Senate begins its recess, uh, Senator Frank Lautenberg today pointed to a string of victories in Congress on his legislative agenda during this work period. Good. <laughs> um, we then found another, there, there was another cluster within the same clustering, which, was, which is basically Mayhew's advertising category. Senator adopts Lautenberg Menendez resolution honoring spelling bee champion from New Jersey. That was a very important thing that the Senate did that day. <laughs> right? Not only did he say that, that, was, that, 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 the congratulations, but he got the entire Senate to approve something. Good for <laughs> Okay. Um, and then we found another cluster, a cluster that you may see as obvious, but people have missed this in the literature for forever. We call it partisan taunting. Okay. Republicans selling out nation on chemical plant security. This is an example. Senator, quote, Senator Lautenberg's amendment would change the name of the Republican bill to, quote, more tax breaks for the rich and more debt for our grandchildren deficit expansion reconciliation act of 2006. <laughs> isn't, that a great, isn't that a great idea? And he put out a press release saying that he did that, right? What was that, right? Was that advertising? No. Was that credit claiming? Was that, was that um, uh, uh, advertising, credit claiming, position taking? You know, it was a, some of each and not really, it was really a partisan taunt. It was like, it was like where's your eye? I need to kick sand in it, right? <laughs> right? Um, and then we realized, well, wait a second. Well, of course, of course senators do this, right? right? So, so uh, what is it? Well, well we, we infer the definition. The definition of partisan taunting is explicit, public, and negative attacks on, on the other political party or its members, right? It's just an, an attack, okay? It, very interesting from a political science point of view, taunting ruins deliberation. Political normative theorists say it's very important that, that senators represent their constituents, but it's also very important that they do something that contradicts that. 
which is they deliberate together, find common ground, or compromise in the interests of the nation. You can imagine the whole thing, right? Well, if they're taunting each other, right, if you're spitting in each other's eye, you're sort of less likely to come to a compromise, okay? Uh, and, and so this is actually a very important variable. It's not only like colorful and interesting and fun, it's actually important for you know, probably functioning democracies to know how much people do this. We are, by the way, now uh, measuring this for like all of the history of Congress. And we're, gonna we're gonna create a website on who the taunters are. Like this guy, he does it 80% of the time. <laughs> you know, he, 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 only, he spends only 5% of the time doing it. He mostly he's mostly worried about policy. But, so I think that'll be cool, but we'll see what that looks like. Um, this is a few other examples. Senator Lautenberg blasts Republicans as chicken hawks. Lautenberg put this in the category of government oversight, <laughs> which I thought was good. <laughs> the Scopes trial took place in 1925. <laughs> Sadly, President Bush's veto today shows we haven't progressed much since then. That's, of course, in the category of health care. Um, every day the House Republicans dragged this out was a day that made our communities less safe. Right? Um, so, that was, we discovered this concept, right? I mean, I mean, other people may have seen this, of course, but we finally realized that this was a category in these, in these data, in these 200 press releases. Um, one senator, 200 press releases. So then what we did is we, we um, got 64,000 press releases from all 301 senator years from the last three years of the Senate, and we try to confirm the same hypothesis. We use... Um, uh, a supervised learning method to measure the proportion of press releases a senator taunts the other party, right? So as, a, as an aside, this is from a different project, an earlier project of mine, um, where, uh, where what people had done in the past to do something like this was so supervised learning, so there's a training set, and then you'd run some classifier to put, put things in different categories, right? But, but there is no classifier in general problems like this that's better than like 60 or 70 percent accurate. We talked about this earlier. Um, and so, and that's fine if you're doing a Google search, right? Because you just search again if you get the wrong answer. But if you're interested in the percent in a category, that's a disaster. Because you, you could be off by, you know, one of the categories instead of 10% could be 50%, right? So we came up with a method that estimated, uh, not, that didn't classify any documents, but estimated the percent in a, in a category in an unbiased way. So we can get an estimate of the percent in a category accurately, basically, you know, essentially right on, um, even, if the, the, uh, even if an optimal classifier is only, you know, 5% accurate or something like that. But anyway, we use that method just to estimate the proportion of press releases in which a senator is committing partisan taunting, okay? And this is a histogram of the results. On average, 27% of the, of, the, of the press releases are partisan taunts. And in 35 years, the political science literature had just sort of missed this in a certain way, right? Um, so I think that we discovered something. I think it's, I think it's important. It, it's, it's very prevalent. Once you see something, once you understand the concept, you see it everywhere. Actually, I, I had a um, high school student working with me and, as a sort of intern, and I said, go see if you can find this, you know, some examples of this in earlier periods. And I thought he was going to go back before the three years, right? So he went back to ancient Rome. Um, <laughs> you know, and he found this quote about, they didn't have political parties back then, but, you know, they had groups that opposed each other. And he, he found this quote about Caesar, um, and, he, and, and it said, um, uh, uh, apparently Caesar liked to sleep with basically everybody. <clears throat> and, and so the quote was, Caesar is, is every man's wife and every woman's husband. <laughs> and that was a real quote from some, you know, it was a partisan taunt, basically. Uh, another peer cluster in the position taken with the doctor, and could one argue that the, in many position taking questions, you could maybe there is some taunting, Essentially, it could be classified as, as position taking. Yeah, I think I think if we if we now knowing the concept of partisan taunting, if we, if we wanted to articulate the categories, we'd have to slightly change the, change them because some some of part, partisan taunts is position taking. It's distinguishing yourself from the opposition. Some of it is sometimes they're partly advertising. Right? When Menendez tries to change the name of the Republican bill, he might actually get on TV because of that. Right. So some of it is advertising, and you know, it's not really credit claiming, but so this, so you just have to, you'd have to read, it, it, it impinges on the other categories, but that's sort of the definite, a new category, the three, the three previous um, categories supposedly exhausted the, the space of, of, of documents, and this would have to impinge on them in some way. Maybe on the same minute, so 27% here are person where there is some, at least one sentence of content, right? No, 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 no. It was well. The, the press releases are relatively coherent. So the question is, which is this? You know, wh what category would you put it in? Like the 
Mm, yeah, basically. So did you use the, the basically a combination of the comma to the nine plus the technique that you found for the, for the one senator? You had a you know, weighted average of different types of clustering methods. Did you use that or did they extrapolate to 64,000? No. We, I, or was it, was it just the supervisor? <coughs> It was just a supervisor. So that's right. It had nothing to do with it. Okay. We, 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 we did. We started over. Okay. We started over. We understood what the categorization, okay. we had a new categorization scheme. We apply it to this new corpus. And we, we see what, you know, now, once you know, if you know what the categories are, you don't want to use an unsupervised method anymore. So that was, we thought we knew something or we wanted to make believe we did. So you, you manually had some number of press releases for these four categories. Yeah. So who did that? You, you, did, you personally did that? No, we had, we had some, so you know. What instructions, like, I, you had, must have had to have defined those categories. So you constructed definitions of those. Well, our, well, we didn't use those four. <clears throat> our, our goal was to measure the percent of partisan taunting in the, the <clears throat> among the 64,000 press releases. <clears throat> so we, so we, um, uh, I forget the exact categories we had there in the paper, but one, one was partisan taunting. The other, so we could distinguish it, another was taunting in other ways, like, you know, it didn't have to be partisan, it could be, you know, other kinds of things. We just wanted to really clearly distinguish it. And then I forget which of the other ones we ended up using that, that way. You know, you have to pretest these things so you get a reliable answer. Different people can, could put things, would end up putting things in the same category. Um, our, our goal wasn't to, wasn't to come up, wasn't to validate the new, a new uh, clustering of, or a new partition of documents for a new topology for, for uh, political science syllabi. It was just to figure out the percent of partisan taunting. The, the, oh, which is that person? Yeah, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't, I don't recall, but, but we're, we're, we're working on that now. <laughs> no, we're really, we're going to have, a, we're going to have a website, and you're going to be able to look up your own congressman. <laughs> It'll be fun. <laughs> um, but we want to make sure we get it right first. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there may be Harvard taunting. <laughs> if there's Harvard taunting, then it'll be a success, right? <laughs> um, it, uh, yeah, and we, we've, we found other things. So we found that in, in districts that are, um, that, are, uh, uh, you know, with, with, that are very mixed with Democrats and Republicans, the, 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 the senator taunts a lot less. So it's you know very conservative Republican and very liberal Democrat districts. They are the ones who are big mouths, right? Because you know this, it's, it's it's always good to make a big deal about all the people who are in the in the teeny minority in your district, because right? Because you're not going to lose those votes, or if you do, it doesn't really matter. Um, so it's so it's actually very interesting that the the big mouths in Congress are the ones talking about talking about. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, that are making all this noise are the extremists. Right, they're not actually the people in the middle. So, anyway, we'll learn. A lot. I hope we'll learn a lot more things like that. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, just a quick summary. Um, in in the social the social sciences are divided um, between uh, sort of qualitative folks like like in our second evaluation, those two scholars, and quantitative folks that look a little like like us. And there's there's you know that's basically the biggest debate in mo within most of the social science departments. Like. Whether we should give you the, you know, or whether we should hire more of you guys or more of, more of our, more of our guys, <coughs> um, and the the general summary is that uh, is that in those is, is that the qualitative folks they know how to conceptualize, and they they do measurement, not quantitative measurement, but they do measurement, and the quantitative folks they mostly do measurement and validation without thinking about what the concept is, and so our idea is that there's no reason why why us quantitative folks can't help with conceptualization also. That's sort of the, that's the idea. Um, so it's quantitative methods for conceptualization and discovery. Um, we could do this a lot more, I think. Um, uh, there's relatively few methods that are sort of designed explicitly for this purpose. Um, cluster analysis is sort of, it's, that's, that's what we think we can make into that. That's sort of the point of this. Um, factor analysis, sort of a continuous version of that, right? Um, maybe you know about this um, famous article from Psychology in 1967, Tom Swift and his electric factor analysis machine, which is, which is basically belittling the task of coming up with ideas from the data, right? Um, 
uh, you know, it's not only it wasn't it isn't it done, but if anybody comes close to doing it, others others uh, uh, argue that it's ridiculous. Um, and, and in any event, we also have some evaluation methods that uh, try to make us vulnerable to being proven wrong. So if you have any other questions, I'm happy to take them, and that's where you can get some more info. Okay. okay thanks a lot. So uh, I pretty much agree with your augmentation view, like there should be a collaborative mix of human and computer. And the question is, where do we draw the line? Now, towards the more computer and more automation end, which, which is corresponding to your technical number of step. And so you mentioned the bottom half is really like, where does the learning bias, where does the objective for costing come from? Now, it appears to me that it is a candidate for sort of a universal clustering objective, which is like, when we think about clustering, what we do is really we try, trying to abstract away the variation we consider important, and then really only keep those differential properties that are, that, that are more important uh, within a cluster. Now, what, what would be the important and, and unimportant? Now, potentially, one way to think about them is that, A, it depends on how frequent that interaction happens, how frequent that differential property will, will, will be will be tied to our survival or our modeling or our reasoning about the work. And also B is like the, what, what is the utility of that differential. So we, we, are, we very rarely uh, encounter a tiger, but if we really encounter it, the, the consequence will be fatal. And, and so combining the two, it appears to me that we can derive some sort of generic learning bias to actually as a learning objective to come up with a generic conceptualization. So I'm so, in, in, so our application is a little different from your application. In our application, the documents go into categories, and it, 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 the document is sort of exists out there in the wild. It's not necessarily connected to any other document, so we can't see its prevalence more in more in one place than, than the other. Um, <clears throat> maybe uh, so. What in, what in what you're doing, you could find a sentence or a paragraph, or maybe a sentence or or a phrase that co-occurs with another more frequently in some documents than others or things like that. And that may help us to understand uh, one way of clustering documents together. Whether there's an open question as to whether that, I mean, that would certainly produce a different clustering and perhaps a really interesting clustering. Um, and then, but, but, a, but a fully automated clustering. And so the question is whether that objective function will also produce what a, some person who would use this technique would think of as insight. And that's the question, right? Um, You know, no way to tell them. There's not much guidance in the literature advance about what various clustering algorithms do it, but I wonder if sort of what you have gives you a new way to approach that question. You can build clusterings of clusterings now, a clustering of clustering algorithms. Now you have how they perform on a bunch of different things, and potentially you ask you know, when they're similar or perhaps even invent, discover interesting new areas of the clustering algorithm space that are. Yeah, well, uh, so one way we can help the if, if you're in the business of creating a new clustering algorithm, okay, you know I would say I mean what I mean what can we say about that? One is you don't have to do it anymore because we have all of them. Um, but another way of thinking about it is there, sometimes if you can really figure out when it would be useful, then that's a really good thing. Um, I think in in his example, there may actually you know his, his objective function may be very seem sounds to me as he explained it to me earlier very closely related to what he's trying to do, so that may work. Um, in but if you're in the business of creating new clustering methods, what I would say is run it through a bunch of documents, cr put this put this space up here, and if you if you land in, in, in the white space, okay. But if you land close to a bunch of other methods, give it up, right? <laughs> you know, we don't need that method, right? Um, but you know, come up with a method that produces something in the white space, and then that may be potentially something interesting. It's a, it's a metric. How long your classification can 
Right, so so, so yeah. there, there are two important issues, scalability and time. <clears throat> so on scalability, I mean, we've run it with like five or 6,000 documents. Um, that's, our, that's just our current setup. <clears throat> our our uh, programming goal is to get it to 100,000. I think probably even before that, it's probably the wrong idea. Probably, you know, there's probably some covariate that would separate them into categories. Um, <clears throat> but we think we can get, the, get basically the, pretty much the same technology working with 100,000 documents. So I, I think why not do that? Um, <clears throat> uh, secondly is uh, changes over time. Um, once you have a clustering at one time that you're interested in, um, <clears throat> there's two questions, right? One is, well, are the prevalence of the documents in the categories changing as you go over time in the same clustering? And the second one is, is there some new insight that, that we might want to discover? Okay. So we could treat these in sequence. So, the, so for the first one, um, once you come up with a clustering, and at one point in time that you find insightful, you find interesting, and you might want to track over time, at that point you have a gigantic labeled training set. Right? And you could use this other method that I described, and you could go over time. Right? And so that, that would work very well. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the, the second is, uh, could you can you discover something new? Is there some new insight? Is there some new new bloom of, of information that, that we might want to find? Well, you could just, I mean, one thing you could do is you could you know wait two weeks or or maybe every day or whatever it is. And it's not an audit. This is not intended to be a fully automated method, right? It's supposed to be it's supposed to be a uh, uh, computer assisted human method. So you could aim the human at it again with this with this uh, assistant, computerized assistant and try it again and see whether you come up with, with some other insight that you may not have had before. So, so uh, if you, um, so found a clustering using um, uh, this method of the, the worry that since all the clusterings were available, um, that um, you know, what you see is not really an insight, but it's some artifact of the Data set. And what would it mean to then, so ideally what you'd like to do is then go on to you know, two and three in your list of, uh, you know, after the conceptualization set is done, which is you know, yeah. to, you know, measure and validate. So what would it mean to, to validate in some statistically done way that a given clustering is right and insightful? Yeah, so. You don't know what the objective is. Right. So, so there's a few different things there. One is, is it insightful? For that, you'll have to make an argument, right? Like we came up with the categorization, and I think, I think just once we come up with the, the, the name partisan taunting and the categorization, and we just convey that to people, I think, I think then it's on us, right? And second question, which is separate in a sense, is, is it just rare, or is it actually a prevalent thing? And for that, we can measure that. Right, we now have a great labeled set, and we can you know, do what we did, essentially, and we can figure out the prevalence of it, of it over time um, and somehow validate. I mean, I think that's really your question. So. Great, thanks a lot. <laughs>